Okay, um, hi everyone. I hope everyone is doing okay. So as you continue to wait for the rest to join, I think I'll start by reading Michelle's bio. Uh, most of you probably, if you're following us on Twitter, we had posted most of this on, on the Twitter space. But in case you haven't, then um, I, mm, some of you might have done the Welcome Connecting Science courses as well. I know some, the people who've joined, they've done a few of that. And you might have seen Michelle's name somewhere. So uh, Dr. Michelle Bishop is the Associate Director for Learning and Training at the Welcome Connecting Science. She leads a team of 25 plus people that develop and deliver genomics training and learning events for researchers and healthcare professionals. And this is aimed at educating, inspiring, and transform, transforming their careers. Uh, this team delivers online uh, content as well as in-person uh, trainings at the Welcome Genome Campus. This is at uh, Hingston in Cambridge. And uh, so they have that in Africa, and they have other hubs in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, she's previously led the Health Education England uh, genomic education program and through her 12 plus years working in the NHS. So for those who don't know what the NHS is, it's the National Health uh, System in the UK. Uh, so f uh, through her 12 years plus working for the NHS, she influenced and shaped national education and training policy for healthcare professionals. Her accomplishments include authoring 50 plus genomics education resources, developing and implementing specialist genomics NHS training, um, as well as providing educational and clinical expertise to national projects. Michelle holds a PhD in genetics counseling. And yeah, thank you, Michelle. And the floor is yours now. All right, thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you for this opportunity um, to talk about my science journey um, and where, I, where I've come from and what I've been doing. And it was actually a really lovely way to reflect on um, my career, or where I started, um, which is more than 20 years ago now, and re reflect on where I started and where I've gone. So it's actually been a really um, lovely opportunity for me as well. So before I start talking about my professional um, career, I thought it might be helpful just to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, while I live and work in the UK, I'm actually Australian. Uh, we moved over to the UK 14 years ago, um, and that was for, for work. Um, a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm married. My husband is also Australian, so both of our families are in Australia, which has made life interesting for us um, in terms of a lack of family support to help um, with childcare um, arrangements. Um, we have one son who is 10. He was born in the UK. Uh, so it's, it's something that we've had to navigate uh, moving countries and to establish those support networks in a different country. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions around that um, later if anyone's got any um, questions and specifically around that. But what I really wanted to do was tell you about my my journey, which is a it, it's it's not the traditional journey, I would say, in terms of science. Um, I have always worked in science or in a clinical area, uh, but it, I haven't taken the traditional route at all. So I'm hoping that this would just provide you with an example of what can happen when you step outside of that traditional pathway. So I started in science um, really in my final year of school. Um, I did all my schooling in Adelaide um, in Australia, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to go to university, or at least my parents wanted me to go to university, uh, but I didn't really know what I wanted to study. I knew I liked science at school. Um, everyone was pushing me to do medicine, but I wasn't very convinced um, about doing that. So in the end, I chose um, what was then called an ordinary Bachelor of Science. And um, back when I did my undergraduate degree, um, our science degrees were very broad. So um, we had over 2,000 people in my graduating class. Um, some of them were uh, majored in physics, some in chemistry, some in biology and other areas. Um, and I majored in genetics and biochemistry. Um, I didn't really 
choose specifically to do those areas. It was just what I ended up doing and what I liked um, from the beginning. So it wasn't a conscious choice that I chose genetics. It was just really where I where I ended up being. Um, as I was finishing my degree, I didn't really know what I wanted to do next again. Um, and I was just kind of pushed into a direction um, because it was the thing that you were supposed to do, which was a honours degree. So in Australia at the time, um, our honours degrees are postgraduate degrees. So we do them after our undergraduate and they're like a master's degree, but crammed into one year. So I did a lab based research project. Um, it was around the cell cycle and looking at the different um, mechanisms um, around the cell cycle um, and working in yeast, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it was a molecular um, biology project and I really enjoyed it. I loved being in the lab. Um, and so because of that, I was then encouraged to do a PhD, which was the next logical next step in the journey. So I was really on a pathway to work in a laboratory and to um, and just to work, do a PhD, then do a postdoc, then do a senior postdoc, you know, and eventually the aim would be to lead your own lab. And that's what I thought the pathway I was going to be on. Um, however, in my PhD, after about 18 months, um, the area I was working on, which was completely different to my honours degree, um, I was the only person in our department that was working on this particular project. And I was the only person in our department who was working on these particular techniques. In fact, no one else knew anything about the techniques I was working on. I had to go elsewhere to be trained um, in actually how to do that. But because all of that, it took a long time to establish any aspect around my PhD. And um, about 18 months into my PhD, um, I actually got scooped. So other labs in the United States published the work that I was working on. Um, and it meant that all the work that I had been done in my PhD, we couldn't use anymore. So this was really the first crossroads that I got to within my um, career. And it was the first time that things hadn't gone to plan. Um, so I had a choice. I could either stay in the lab and actually my department was really supportive and said that they would help support financially for me to start all over again in my PhD if that's what I wanted to do. Or I could choose to leave the program and do something else. And I took a, a while, actually, I took three months to make a decision about what I was going to do. Um, and in the end, I actually decided to leave the PhD program. Um, and this was because I knew at that point that I would have to start all over again. I had already decided I didn't think that being in a lab was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Uh, so it seemed like a good opportunity to leave. Uh, but then the question was, what was I going to do? next i'd had this whole part like my whole career pathway had been mapped out for me and now i was stepping away from that so i really took some time to think about what other options were available um it was really the first time i'd looked at that uh nothing had really been said to us um, about what other options were available to us and so at that time the options were to be going to like science communication um writing is not something I enjoy doing at all. And I would say it's a skill that I've had to learn to do. It's not a natural thing for me. So to have a whole career working as a science writer was not something that I was interested in. The other area was being a teacher. Um, my parents are both school teachers and it was not something that I'd ever seen myself doing. I would have liked to work at a university as a lecturer, but at that time and in my university, um, they didn't employ people just as lecturers, they employed people as researchers and then you lectured on the side. So that really wasn't an option then either. But I remembered in my third year of university hearing about what was then a relatively new profession of genetic counselling. And it seemed to, to provide the opportunity for me to do the science aspect, which I really enjoyed, but then also working with individuals, which that science really affected. Um, so patients that had genetic conditions. Uh, 
And I was really quite fortunate that my PhD supervisor at the time knew someone who had trained as a genetic counsellor um, and put me in touch with them. So I could hear more about it from someone who'd gone through a similar process to me, moving out of research and moving into genetic counselling. Once I talked to that person, I was thought that this was, was my career and um, happily um, moved into that direction spent the time to work out what I needed to do to get into the genetic counselling training um, and then applied and thankfully was successful because I didn't have a plan B um, at that stage. Um, I then moved to Melbourne, so I had to move cities to do the training um, and the training was great. I absolutely loved it um, and I worked as a genetic counsellor for a number of years. So I worked um, in the prenatal arena, so this is where um, I worked with families that um, were couples who were pregnant, where the, there was a chance that the baby might have a genetic condition and so worked with the couples both before genetic testing and after genetic testing um, as well for a range of different genetic conditions. And I also worked in hereditary cancer clinics as well, where I worked with families where there was um, a hereditary cancer um, predisposition and um, worked with um, individuals before testing and, and after testing. And I really did enjoy it. But after a few years, I realised I really missed the research. I never really lost that love of research. Uh, so I was looking for how I could, could incorporate research into my genetic counselling career. And around the same time, I realised I was doing quite a lot of education as well. So a lot of education of healthcare professionals that we were interacting um, with as a genetic counsellor. And so I started to get an interest in research around education. So this was a completely different type of research to what I'd done before. Before I was in a lab. Um, and this was around the social science aspect of research. So I had to do a lot of training to understand this research, but I absolutely loved it. And through this process, I was given the opportunity to apply for a PhD program, so another PhD program. So this was really my next crossroads, where I had to make a decision about whether I would stay in a clinical role or whether I would move into a more academic role, but a different type of academic role. And this was when the first time I really utilised um, mentors. And if you take nothing else away from my journey, I would say find yourself a good mentor or good mentors because they will be instrumental in helping you identify what is um, a good, good professional choices for you. They won't tell you what to do, but they will help you work out what is best for you. And so I had a couple of mentors that I had established um, through the work that I've been doing as a genetic counsellor. One was a genetic counsellor, but had done a lot of research, social science research. And the other was um, a person who was heavily involved in the training program for genetic counselling. And they were the ones that actually approached me about doing a PhD and through um, talking with them, I really worked out whether doing a PhD was going to be a good thing for me. Um, there were a lot of decisions that I had to think about. Um, I was a little bit older um, than I was previously when I looked at doing a PhD. Um, it was I was a different time in my life. Um, I was just about to get married um, and I still don't know whether doing a PhD in the first couple of years of your uh, marriage is the right decision. But um, we're still married, so obviously we got through that process. And um, and also I was going to be taking a pay cut because I would be on a PhD stipend, um, so I wouldn't be getting the full salary that I was used to. But my mentors helped me realise that actually I did want to move into roles that would have a research element to that and it would be more useful for me to have a PhD and to go through that training um, if I wanted to move into that into that role, in particular, if I wanted to work in academia in Australia, um, a PhD was really something that I should um, look to doing. So I decided to take the jump and do a PhD. Um, so again, that was great. I loved doing my PhD. I still did one day clinical work um, a week, so it meant I still had that my foot in the clinical um, world, but through the process, I realised that actually 
while I enjoyed my clinical work, it wasn't what I saw myself doing for the rest of my um, career. And it was during the course of my PhD that really set me up for what I have done since I finished my PhD um, over 14 years ago now, um, where my PhD supervisors, who were my mentors, became my PhD supervisors and have continued to be my mentors since then, really helped me establish connections and networks. So every meeting we went to, every conference that we went to, we would sit down beforehand and identify key individuals who were going to be at that conference that they could introduce me to. So every meeting I went to and every conference I went to, I met more individuals who had become part of my professional network. And that was so important so that I could make connections internationally um, and really know what else was out there in, in, in this area, which is quite a small area. And especially 14, 15 years ago, it was a very small area. Very few people worked in this area. But it was through this that I actually got my first job um, in the UK. And that was initially going to be a one year position. Um, we made the decision to move over. Um, my husband and I are quite fortunate in the fact that my husband's mother was English, so he had dual citizenship. And my grandfather was Scottish, so I could get an ancestry visa. So for us, we were very lucky that it was easy for us to move over to the UK and we could make that decision to only move over for a year. Um, my husband was quite happy to take a break in his role and it was we felt that it was important for my career um, to, to have this experience internationally. Little did we know that that one year would turn into 14 years and we're, and we're still here. But um, anyway, it was it was a great job. And actually, I, I stayed in that same um, organisation for, for 12 years. Um, I moved up in the organisation. I um, did not stay in the same job, um, but it was a great organisation for me to, to work in. But I would say that once you move away from that traditional pathway, which I have, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a pathway in front of you for you to move up um, in your career. And that's something that I certainly found. Um, I had to um, basically design my, my, my roles, my new job, every time I wanted to move up. Um, and that that took a lot of effort to do there. There was nowhere else. There was there wasn't a job there for me. So I had to create that position and convince people that actually they needed someone like me to be in that position and that I was worth the, the money that I was asking for. And it was only really by using my mentors that allowed me to do that. I don't think I could have done that by myself, but they were very encouraging. They provided a lot of support. They read a lot of the documentation that I pulled together. They pointed me in the direction of other people who could help support me. Um, so I would say that if you're if you are moving outside of that traditional pathway, you definitely need support um, in in helping you identify where your next step is in your professional career. I don't necessarily think you can do that by yourself. Um, I also had to learn, which was a really hard thing for me to do originally, but I had to learn to advocate for myself. No one else was going to do that. Um, to be honest, I think my employers would have been quite happy for me to take on more responsibility and not pay me any more money. Um, so I had to advocate for myself around that. So the lesson I learned there was don't wait around for someone else to recognise your talent. You absolutely need to do that yourself. But I think your mentors will help you recognise when the time is right to fight for that promotion. There were some times that I thought I was ready and my mentors would say, mm, I think you just need to wait a little bit more or you need to get a little bit more experience in this area. Um, and they were right. Um, they, they put the brakes on me um, and my ambitions at the right time, but also encouraged me when it was the right time as well. So I worked in the National Health Service, um, as Ruth said, for 13 years. Um, and then um, about 18 months ago now, um, the opportunity for the role I'm currently in um, came up. 
It was still in education and genomics, but it was very different to the role that I'd had previously. So again, that was a, that was another decision I had to make. And it's the last crossroad, I would say, that I've had in my career. I'm sure it won't be the last one forever, but the last one that I've had so far. And for me, it was a big decision to leave the National Health Service. Um, I'd got very comfortable there. I, I'd made a name for myself there. I was recognised for the work I had done, but I realised there was nowhere else for me to go there. Mm -hmm. So the decision I had to make was whether I wanted to stay in a comfortable position or challenge myself again. And again, my mentors were great in being able to talk through this with me and I realised that actually I needed a new challenge. So that's how I've got to where I am today. Um, it's been a very windy road, I would say. Um, it definitely is not the traditional um, pathway. Um, and I've got three takeaways that I would tell my younger self if I was going through it all again, that it's absolutely okay to go down this non-traditional route. Um, I think it can be scary um, if you're doing something that no one else has really done before. Um, but I feel that the career I've had, and I often call it a portfolio career because I feel like I've had different careers in different places. It's been an absolute advantage for me. Um, there's not many people um, who have my skill set because I've worked in a lab. I've had clinical experience. I'm a social scientist and I'm also an educationalist. And that can be a really good selling point when you're going for, for jobs to have that range of skills and that range of experience. Um, I've also learned that even if things take a detour that you weren't expecting, like my first attempt at a PhD, um, actually I picked up some really useful skills at that point. So while some people might have thought it was a waste of two years, to me, I picked up a lot of skills that I wouldn't have got any other way. So I still got a benefit out of it. Um, and I think I tell people now that even if you're not going somewhere or you're not doing a job that you feel is exactly where you want to be, you will always pick up skills that you will be able to use later and it will make you a more rounded professional in the end. Um, and the last one is find a good mentor. Um, I know it can be hard to find a really good mentor. I've been incredibly fortunate with the mentors that I've had in my life. Um, and I have several mentors for, for different things, um, but there are two that have been constant really for about the last 20 years. Um, and they're more friends now actually than mentors, but I do call on them um, as a mentor every now and then. Um, and so I, I think you don't, you don't have to stick with like a supervisor if you've done a PhD. Definitely find someone you admire, find someone that you can talk to easily, someone that will be comfortable in challenging you um, as well. Um, definitely ask for recommendations, but also shop around as well if until you find someone that you're comfortable with um, and it would definitely be worth the investment in time. So that's a really quick journey for my, my science journey. Um, <laughs> in the very non-traditional route, non-traditional lab um, sense. But um, it's, yeah, I'm probably, much as I would like to think I'm close to retirement, I still have quite a long way to go. So who knows where my, my career will take me next. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, that was a really good eye open. I mean, I've been noting down <laughs> a lot of things as you were speaking and even though I had interacted with you before, I, it's, this has been a good platform because now I've gotten to know more things about you and yeah, and how you moved from one PhD to the other. You know, I mean, a lot of people fear taking taking such steps. So after maybe uh, the first, the first uh, time it didn't work, someone might have given up and gone on to do other things and just forget about science. So, and talking about that, my question would be, what motivated you to stick to doing, even though it wasn't the traditional kind of science, but still stick stick in the field of science? Um, for me, I've always loved genetics. Like um, I 
I got into get got interested in genetics through Jurassic Park, which I think for people of my generation seems to be the link, the book or the movie that got them in there. And I've just always been fascinated by it. So I knew when I left my PhD, I still wanted to do something that was in science. So it was just trying to find a job or a, a training program that incorporated that. That was really important to me. Um, I I don't know at that stage whether I was still interested in research, but I realised that when I was doing my training and when I was working, that I was always gravitating towards talking to people about research. And I think I was just really fortunate that I was around these two individuals who were my mentors that also recognised that and showed me the opportunities that were available. So I would say a lot of the decisions that I've made have been luck. Um, I was I was very lucky, but I was always very clear that what I wanted to do in my life, I had to enjoy it. And science was something I enjoyed. Mm. Okay, so uh, if anyone else has a question for Michelle, just raise your hand or type in the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the, I think you emphasized about the need for having good mentors. And I think this is a discussion that also has been going on for a long time. But the question that people keep asking is, how do you identify a good mentor? And do you approach them or do you wait for them to like approach you? What is your take on that? I would say absolutely approach them. Um, I think if people, if you wait for people to approach you, you may be waiting for a very long time. Uh, so I would always take the proactive step. I know um, it can be really challenging to do that. Um, so for some mentors that I've had, um, I have found I knew that I wanted them to be my mentor um, and I didn't know quite how to approach them. So I tried to find someone who knew them, who I also knew, who could introduce me um, to the mentor. Um, and sometimes I didn't, in some cases, didn't necessarily ask them straight away to be a mentor. I just asked for some time to talk to them about my career aspirations or to ask them some questions. And just over time, found that yes, they were giving me advice that was helpful. I felt very comfortable talking to them and that's when I approached them to, to have a more formal mentor arrangement. I, I have found, I haven't actually found anyone yet that said no to me when I've asked that. Most people I think in this field are really happy to mentor and if they say no, it's usually because they don't have the time and they don't feel they can give you the, the, the time commitment that you deserve. Um, but I think everyone has benefited from having a mentor, so is happy to pass it on to someone else if they can as well. And I have learned over time, um, and I think this comes with age sometimes, that actually if you ask someone and they say no, that's the worst thing that can happen. It's better to ask and find out that someone doesn't have the time and can't do that than not ask at all. And if someone can't, doesn't have the time, they can often introduce you to someone else who may have the time. So um, I would always say ask. Yeah, thank you. And uh, another question is, um, now that you moved from Australia to the UK and also as a, in, as a woman in this field, I am just curious about how you are able to strike a work-life balance. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> okay, with all the uh, child care and, and 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 yeah, sort of support, family support. It's. Uh, I would say that I don't think I've quite figured out how to strike that balance just yet. Um, it can be really hard when you don't have family around. Um, we we have no family that lives in the UK. Um, so we definitely felt that especially when my son was younger around the lack of support with with child care um i would say you know having a supportive partner is absolutely essential um for us we my husband's been incredibly supportive of my career and any decisions that 
either of us have made about our career, we've made them together. So we've made that it's it's like a family decision as opposed to my decision. And we we do think about the impact it will have on the family. So for example, my current job, um, I I live 200 miles away from, well, no, not 200 miles away. It's 120 miles away from where my yeah. work is. Yeah. And so we really had to think about what that impact would be. And I think in some ways COVID was helpful because hybrid working is available. So mm -hmm. we, we now work where I am in Cambridge on a Tuesday to Thursday um, mm -hmm. and I'm home on Mondays and Fridays like today. Um, but it's something that we had to agree with as a family. And I even included my son in those discussions um, as well. And we've learned to ask for help when we need it, which which can can be hard sometimes, but people are willing to to help. And we've we've made some really good friends um, through through ch our children. Um, and we know that they're there if we need if we need help at any time. But it's it's not easy, definitely not easy. Um, and yeah, you do make mistakes along the way. I've certainly done that. <laughs> All right, uh, I think we have a question for from Pasili. She says, thank Dr. Michelle for the amazing and inspiring talk. How did you train yourself to advocate for you? And that was oh, a very good question. Right. question. <laughs> um, and it, it was a hard thing to do. It's not something that comes naturally to me, I would say. There are some people who are brilliant at doing this. Um, I, I really struggled and I got I was getting really frustrated because I felt that I wasn't moving in my career and it took my mentor actually um, to actually just say to me, you know, have you asked for this? Does anyone know that you, you're you doing this work and you're not really getting paid for it? And I just went, oh, no. And so from then they coached me through that. So I didn't do any formal training, but I they helped me, you know, even just to write emails. They checked my emails for me. They, um, you know, before I had a meeting with someone, we would talk through what I was going to say. They would, you know, prep me for that, like maybe ask questions. Um, so, you know, it may have helped that my, my supervisors are also genetic counsellors. So we're very used to having these types of conversations and to plan for things like this. But I would say I'm still training myself to do that. I think it's a lifelong thing for me. It definitely is not something that's easy, but um, practice helps talking through with other people, getting tips from people and um, and for, and finding people who have done it before and asking what they have done to do that as well. I think that's that's how I did that. I'm, just, I'm still learning. Yeah, and uh, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every day. Every day I deal with imposter syndrome. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I found that um, everyone else perceives you differently to how you perceive yourself. Um, and it's, I mean, I still get surprised when I'm at conferences and people know who I am because I still see myself as that person from 20 years ago who walked into a conference and didn't know anyone. And so it's, um, yeah, I think it's, it is something that I think a lot of people deal with in science, especially a lot of women deal with in science as well. Um, but it's, again, it, it's almost that making it, faking it till you make it is what they say, but feeling feeling confident about what you're doing. And actually, if you've got that role, there is a reason why you've got that and to feel confident about that. And again, going back to the mentors, my mentors have been great in, in providing me like with that support and everything. But no, I, I don't think imposter syndrome goes away. <laughs> okay. okay. And what about rejections? Like, have you had rejections along the way? And oh, how do you with that because I know a number of people as well uh, have been trying to get positions but in as much as they feel like they are putting in all the effort 
uh, using all the support from the mentors, they are still not able to get the positions they want to get. And sometimes it could be really difficult. So uh, how do you deal with that? How did you deal with that? So, yeah, I mean, that is is really, really hard. Um, there have been some times um, that I applied for jobs and I didn't get them and uh, times I applied for promotion and didn't get them. Even, you know, submitting papers and getting papers rejected from journals um, as well. Um, at the time, it is really, really hard. Um, what I've learned over time, and I think it comes from being on the other side when you are recruiting people as well, that I now can see that if I don't get a role, it's because I may not be right for the role. It's not against me personally. And I used to take everything so personally, um, but now I can see that actually when I really look at it, okay, that person who did get the role had something that I didn't have that is right for the role that they got. So I've learned to be a little bit more objective um, about it. And I've always asked for feedback, always asked for feedback, because, you know, it might have been that I would have got the role if I'd had, you know, some more skills in a particular area or more experience in that. And then that's what I've then gone out to get those skills or to get more experience in that. Or if, they felt that I hadn't explained um, a part of, you know, one of the questions that they asked me, they feel like I didn't really provide the explanation they were looking for. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I knew that and I could say that, but I just didn't articulate it. I didn't say it well enough for them to, to understand. So um, by getting that feedback, I could see where I may have either made mistakes or to find out the reason why someone else was better equipped um, for that role. So I would always say that um, getting feedback wherever you can, and most people are really happy to give that feedback um, as well. Um, again, going back to the mentors, I found them really helpful because, you know, I, I, I think it's very few people in science that have never been rejected for something. We've all gone through that process. We'll all have different coping skills. And by talking to as many people as you can, you'll identify your own set of coping skills um, to go through that. Great. Uh, there's a question from Kautha. She says, how did you navigate through the stormy times in your science journey, that is when things didn't go as planned, how did you stay motivated and kept going? Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, it, it was hard, I'm not going to lie. At the time when my PhD went really bad, a really, really, really hard time for me. Um, it was probably the first time in my life where things did not go to plan. And I didn't know, I didn't have any coping mechanism for it. I didn't know how to, I felt like such a failure and I really did not know what to do. And um, looking back, I actually really don't know what kept me motivated actually. Um, I didn't have the, that support system of a mentor or anything like that at that point. I suppose at one point I just woke up one morning and was just like, well, I need to do something. I need to find some kind of job. So either I'm going to do something I really enjoy or I just need to do something. And that is what kept me going. And as soon as I then had a new plan and a new goal, that's what kept me motivated. So it was finding that new goal that was really, really important. But um, it was hard. And I you know, I don't want to delve too much into raising children or anything like that. But for me, it's something I've learned that because everything had gone so smoothly in my life up until then, I didn't know how to cope when it went wrong. So I, I'm, I'm pleased in some way when things don't quite go right for my son, because he's learning those skills of how to cope when things don't go to plan now. Um, and I wish that I'd learnt that when I was growing up rather than when I was 21 or whenever I was. Um, but yeah, I would say for me, it was finding that new goal and then that gave me something to focus on. Um, and it felt like a step forward. Right. Ayla asked, I know the technician, but the advanced 
Moi, j'avais peur de celle-ci. So, I've just lost your sound. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So that's all right. Um, yeah, so I heard the question. That's that's fine. Um, okay, so, yeah, I, I... This is a really good question. Actually, I'm struggling to know how to answer it, actually. Um, I, I think for me, this is... My career's probably pathway is probably going to be similar to a lot of people nowadays. Um, but back, you know, when I first started, if you went into this pathway of going into science, being in a lab, you almost knew what was expected of you. It was that, you know, the steps were there in front of you and you and you just followed the steps. Um, and it's it was only after those first two times when I really had those crossroads. And I think I was fortunate that they were fortunate or unfortunate, but I was fortunate in that they were for, I had to make a decision. It wasn't like I, everything was going really well and I chose to step out. Like there was, it was literally a crossroad where I had to make a decision to go one way or another. And it was only through that in the first two instances where I, I realised that what I was doing, and I was doing it unconsciously to start off with, was thinking about what it was that I really liked and what it was that I really enjoyed. Um, so the first time when my PhD went bad and I had to decide what I was doing next, I, I really thought about what it, what is it that I really enjoy doing? And it was still the science, but I knew I didn't like being in the lab. So I needed to find something that had the science but something else around it. Um, and that helped me get into the genetic counselling aspect. When I was then at the next crossroad where, you know, I had to make a decision was either I sign a contract for this permanent clinical role, which was going to take me down one pathway, or take up this opportunity of a PhD. Again, I stepped back and thought, what is it that I really like? And where do I see myself in 5, 10, 15 years? And it was by taking that time to think about it and think about what I enjoyed doing and where I saw myself that helped me um, think about it. So that may not work for everyone, but it's definitely something that I do now. So the last crossroads I had was when I decided to take, you know, apply for my current role and then to leave the NHS. I didn't have to do that. It wasn't like my, you know, I had to leave my job. I could still have been, you know, my job was there. Um, so that was a crossroads that wasn't forced on me, but I did exactly the same thing about thinking about what is it that I'm enjoying about this? What are the key factors in the role that I like? Are those factors in the other, uh, in this new role that I'm looking at? And where can I see myself in five years? Where can I see myself in 10 years? And that helped me to, to make that leap to go, actually, it is right to, to, to make this change. So for me, it's about reflection taking the time and really thinking about what it is about my particular job that I like and what I want to take forward in the future. Great. I hope that helps you. I don't know why I have an echo. Okay, should be fine now. Uh, do we have anyone else who has a question? You could uh, quickly raise your hand and just speak up if we are, I don't want to close yeah. speaking. this might my kids and me okay so um maybe a final question from me Michelle will be I think a lot of people talk about how challenging a PhD is and how difficult it is and that you get all this mental in quotes mental health problems um so i'm just curious uh you did three phds practically um how was your experience how was your experience doing doing the the, the phd program yeah so that my first attempt at it it was 
it was fun. It was so much fun. But I think it was because I was so young. I wasn't really thinking about the future. And it was um, it was just something that we did. Like, I didn't even really think about it when I joined it. I didn't really think about what it was going to mean in terms of the amount of time and effort um, required because it was just it was just what you did. It was just the next step in the process. Um, when I did my PhD in genetics education, it I enjoyed it, but I was doing it. There was more purpose for it, so I treated it more like a job. And I um, and I think that's because I'd, I had been working previously, so I got into that mindset of a job, and I really did treat it like a job. So I, I tried to keep it to you know normal working hours. Um, I tried to. I always made sure that I took holidays, um, and and really try to make those limits on it not consuming my every waking hour, which PhDs can absolutely do. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't already had a job. Um, so it's really it is really hard to make sure that you don't let your PhD consume you. Um, I know people were telling me when I was doing my PhD and I just didn't believe them when they were telling me that actually it is the only time in your life that you can just do something that you're interested in and you don't have to worry about, you know, you know, other it's it's not like a job where you're answerable to a boss. You can you can be selfish about it. You can explore the areas that you want to do and it is your project. And I, I didn't really appreciate that while I was doing the PhD because I was so consumed by the PhD. Um, I wrote up my PhD while I was also working full time and I would not recommend that to anyone if you could help it. Um, but it was a necessity for me. Um, but... Yeah, I think it's it. I I think it's the boundaries, just making sure and and forgiving yourself if you take time. Like, don't beat yourself up about it. If if you're taking two weeks holiday, take two weeks holiday. Don't take papers with you to read. Don't take data to to look at. Don't don't write a talk while you're there. You need a break and and be kind to yourself. It's okay to do that. It's good for you to do that. Your PhD will benefit from that. Um, and you need to give yourself permission to do that. Thank you so much, Michelle. That, that cuts deep into me because I don't know whether I take holidays. <laughs> or I continue to work just from a different location. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, that, that's yeah. not a holiday. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you so much. For those who've joined, uh, in, I think some people are joining in the middle of their conversation and some are leaving and all that. But don't worry, we have recorded this and we'll share it later on. Uh, maybe you might just miss out on asking Michelle uh, questions on the live, but that's fine. Uh, we can always, you can always reach out to her on Twitter. Yeah, um, her Twitter account, I think. Hey, uh, maybe Michelle, you can type it in the chat I will type it in the chat yeah all right and thank you guys for joining in as well I hope you picked one or two things I have picked a number from this thank you so much Michelle and thank you for showing us that you can thrive as well in other um, you don't have to do science in a traditional way you can still do science in other ways and still thrive uh, at, at them and also to like ask for what you think you deserve and not just you know you know most of us are like ah uh, if i talk if i speak maybe they will suck me or they will chase me away or they will say yeah so uh, i think that was also very important to learn that it is okay to ask for things and it is okay to make your voice heard as well so thank you so much and yeah that's all for this session here and we hope to see you again some other time thank you all right, bye everyone.